This episode is brought to you by Heidi. Imagine kicking back while a HIPAA compliant AI scribe writes your soap notes for free. Yes, you heard us right. Heidi is free. I'm Dr. Tom, Heidi's CEO and founder, and we started Heidi to stop clinicians wasting their life on clinical documentation. Heidi transforms your consult babble into crisp, clear soap notes, personalizing itself with every edit. One day, Heidi will be your AI resident, looking through research, explaining plans, and doing anything you don't want to. If you currently pay for an AI scribe in your practice, you should swap to Heidi. We'll even credit you for anything you've already paid. Dive into the description for the link and make your practice the envy of every stethoscope in town. Sign up and watch Heidi work its magic all for free because you've got better things to do. You're going on an outdoor trip with some friends and you are the only physician. So you know, if there's an illness or injury, everyone's going to be looking at you. Doesn't matter what specialty you're in, you're the doctor. What do we pack and how do we prepare? Stay tuned and find out. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Welcome back to the podcast. On today's show, we have Dr. Richard Ingebrigtsen, who graduated from the University of Utah with a master's in physics and a PhD in physics education. And if that wasn't enough, went on to med school at the same school, completed a residency in internal medicine and fellowship in emergency medicine in Salt Lake City, and is now a clinical instructor of medicine at the University of Utah School of Medicine and a professor in the Department of Physics. He's the program director of the Wilderness Program at the University of Utah School of Medicine and the medical director of Salt Lake County's Sheriff's Search and Rescue. He's the founder of the Glen Canyon Institute, is also the vice chair of the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance. All of this is why we're talking to him today about wilderness medicine. But still, there's more. He founded Wilderness Medicine of Utah to teach backcountry medicine and is the owner of Riverbound Adventures, an education river trip company. So, Dr. Ingebrigtsen, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Honored to be here. Just thrilled, honestly. When I got the email, I was excited. So I'm really thrilled. So I appreciate you're going to be you're going to be helping us to be more useful because, you know, I'm an otolaryngologist. So if someone's having a nosebleed, know exactly what to do. But any other illnesses or injuries where we don't have access to, you know, an emergency services, or I don't have in- access to all my fancy tools and scopes and stuff, I'm not sure how useful I'm going to be. So I appreciate you helping me and our colleagues to be just a little more useful than we otherwise would be in, uh, in an austere environment. Happy to help. I had a similar experience when I, the, the very morning after I graduated from medical school, I was biking with a buddy of mine who happens to be my dentist. And after his training, he uh, became an EMT and knew how to triage injured people while we're biking right off the road when we saw a biker crash, knocked out, became uptounded, started to wake up. But Paul, my friend, went over, triaged him, stabilized his neck, opened his mouth, made sure he was okay, and then called for help and was holding his neck. A little crowd had gathered, and then, I don't know, 10 minutes into this, some <laughs> a doctor attending physician literally just came barging through and said, stand back, stand back. I'm a doctor. I'm an internist. And then he just looked down at that guy and just started yelling at him. Are you okay? Are you okay? And I thought, oh my gosh. But the sad thing was, is I didn't know much more than he did. And that was a moment for me because I realized that I spent a good deal of my time with people, family, friends, grandkids outdoors. And that I people had a need to treat like you said, a bloody nose. I mean, what do you do when you're far away? Mm-hmm. And the recreation business is getting huge, of course. Like this, there's so much outdoors now from biking and there is skiing and snowboarding and the, you know, climbing. And so many people are doing this and they just go willy nilly without any knowledge. So the, when I finished my training, I joined the faculty and I thought we are always going to make sure our medical students and others and anybody can know how to know about wilderness medicine. And it's not just rescue medicine, but what sunscreens to use, how to get rid of a tick, what shoes do you wear if you're running and hiking, and the simple things that the the parents and the, the scout leaders and the club leaders will know so that if there's trouble. And like you said, a nosebleed is a big problem. What do you do? You're in the back country, there you are. Most things people see in the back country aren't emergency. Most problems that people have in the back country relate completely to the very common things, like you said, a nosebleed or a tick or a splinter 
And when you're out there, you don't have the things that you need. So that's been our goal all along. So so that's a, a perfect segue to, to one of my questions, which is, you know, what should we be keeping, say, in our backpacks, right? What are some useful yet light things uh, that we should be carrying with us so we can be a little more useful to our friends and family? That is the number one question we are asked. That is singly the number one question we get asked about people going to the backcountry is what do we take with us? There is, and it's, it, there is not a simple answer to it. So we came up with a little algorithm for it. And let me give you some ideas and some hints what you take. Number one, what is going to be the most common injury illnesses that you could potentially encounter while you're in the backcountry? What, what are those things? Like, what is it? For example, if you're going backpacking, you're going to have back pain, neck pain, and blisters. And so you want a lot of blister care, foot care, and things like that. If you're going to go climbing, then the number one climbing injury are your hands, the, those pulleys, A3, particularly are those pulley injuries. And you've got to protect those and watch those. Shoulder injuries, wrist injuries with climbers. Biking, I don't need to tell the listeners what the problem is if they go biking. Their neck hurts and their rear end hurts. <laughs> and uh, sometimes their knee hurts. You have to be able to treat those. And so it goes as you go down and everything is going to be a little bit different uh, depending upon what the situation is. Now, what you put in your backpack then determines this. So if you're going on a backpacking trip, take a lot of material for blisters. And then you're going to have to ask the question, how long is the trip? If it's going to be just up the mountain and back, you don't need much. But if it's going to be on the John Muir Trail in California, or if you're trekking Switzerland, or if you're going to go hike around the Agora Crater in Africa, then you're going to need a lot more care. And so maybe you take a lot. And the best advice I can give if you're going with friends is make sure everybody takes their own stuff so they're not one person. Now, I know your audience is mostly physicians and medical people that are listening to this. You should not, those people that are listening should not be the ones that carry everything. I mean, you're going to be called on if you have more medical knowledge to treat, but People know what their problems are. And if you say, take stuff that you know you're going to have, then you're going to be in a lot of help. But if you're looking at the most common injuries in the outdoors, just all the way around, like physical injuries, it's skin injuries, and you never have enough. So I don't know, backcountry trips, wherever you go in a couple of days, someone gets a burn, a cut, a scrape. So just make sure of all comers, it's going to be skin injuries by far. They're still going to be not necessarily know to do all that stuff so you can bring it with you. And then when it's time to actually travel, then you can distribute it among your friends to make sure that you're not shouldering all the burden, but it's probably on you to think of it first, right? Oh, absolutely. W without any question. The one thing that I discovered when I went into medical school is people came to me, asked me questions just because I was a physician, whether I knew anything about it or not. But if you go in the back country, you are going to have to answer questions. You should take and study just general wilderness medicine. And our site, by the way, and the School of Medicine site is free. You can just go there and read about it or you can go online and watch YouTube videos and like how do you treat a blister and what, and, you know, what other people take. But the, the other thing is medicines. So first of all, what are the most common injuries? How long are you going to be gone? How many people are going with you? How far away are you from definitive care? will help. And then the other question is, what diseases do the people have that are going with you? They have diabetes, do they have heart disease? Do they, are they young? Have they ever done something else before? Are they older? Like, are they likely to have a heart attack and things like that so that you can be prepared for those things? So preparation matters. So, and then the other thing you have to say, if you're far away, what are you going to take in your first aid kit that would be useful for survival? In other words, you get uh, an avalanche or a, a thunderstorm comes in or a snowstorm comes in and now you're trapped. How do you communicate? How do you keep people warm? Uh, so survival equipment and rescue equipment, like getting people in. So many stories are out there for people who have forgotten to bring cell phones. And how do you get rescue help uh, from where you're at? So that's the other thing. So you mentioned survival. So I'm, I'm thinking, let's say we're in a situation where, you know, you thought you were just going on a day hike. Now, suddenly you got turned around, you're lost. And so you don't necessarily, you didn't plan accordingly. And so you want to make sure you've got some versatile stuff in your bag in case something like that happens, right? Worse than you thought was going to. 
Yeah, well, not even versatile is you're going to have to sort of dream up and ha- improvise. For example, you're going on a day hike with your friends and it's just a trail you've been on a hundred times. Then someone trips and twists an ankle and it may not be broken. It may be broken. You don't know out there, but you they can't walk on it. And you didn't bring a splint. So now you have to improvise. So we always say bring some duct tape or bring some tape or cloth. You're going to get a stick and then you're going to wrap it around the ankle and then you're going to find a walking stick or something to help them get down. So improvisation is absolutely essential in wilderness medicine because there's not one situation, you know, one thing that you can bring that will handle all the situations that you're going to need. So that becomes really important that you learn about improvisation. But, you know, the thing is that if you just use your head before you go and just think, well, what are the possibilities of things going really wrong? Like if it's in the fall and, you know, it might turn cold or might turn rainy, take some extra space blankets, make sure everybody takes you know, something to keep them warm out there so they don't be, develop hypothermia or something. Those are the things that will make you a true star rather than having to improvise. Now, here's a silly one, and this is something that nobody, when I got into wilderness medicine, I discovered this. There's a lot of little things that people don't think about. Like, and I do hike a lot, and we take family, friends, and grandkids and stuff, backpacking and hiking, is cutting your toenails. And people think, well, why is that? Well, if your toenail sticks out in front, and you hit a rock with your shoe, it's going to push that toenail back and it's going to hurt and it's common. And then that's going to try and lift up and you cannot hike. So before I hike with anybody, I take my nail clippers and I say, take off your shoes. Like, why am I doing this? Especially if it's going to be a a longer hike or like if we're going over a mountain or if we're going to go downhill over rocks, I have them take off their shoes first and I say, trim your toenails so that we know that they're going to be able to handle it. So the duct tape was not surprising. The space blankets, not surprising. That all makes sense. I was not expecting you to talk about toenails on this interview. But yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, the sad thing is, is I'm guilty of that. Last summer, I was hiking with family and friends, and I just hadn't looked at my toenails for a while. And I came down and my foot, my big toe on my left foot, I just walking and I had good shoes on. I just hit a rock and oh my gosh, it hurt. So I took off and you, and it had pushed the toenail back. And sure enough, two days later, the nail came off, but it was hard to get down off the mountain. And so I had broken my own rule and not to look at toenails. And also when I say this, if you're, if, like if you're going backpacking, I always make sure that the, the shoes are fitting correctly. Yeah, that's a real problem. Shoes are always normally too tight, which causes blisters. I make sure that I've got moleskin. And the other thing is I look at socks. And if I think their socks aren't going to make it, I'll, I bring extra socks and I say, try these. So they've got wool line socks so that you can wick water away and they don't get the blisters that they do if their shoes get sweaty. So I'm, it, those are the kinds of things. Now, here's the deal. This podcast, I love the title of it. And it, it says what we should have been studying when we're in the Krebs cycle. I understand that completely. And here's the deal. So practicality is the name of wilderness medicine. You absolutely don't under, need to understand bio chemistry in the great detail when you're in that country. However, you don't have the right shoes, the right socks, and your toenails cut, you're not going to make it on a hike. The people, the medical people listening to this, it is important that you study your, the, you know, the diseases of the feet that you get when you're hiking and making sure that the arches, art support is good, the shoes are good and things like that, because you're going to be the one that's going to have to take the blame if they get a blister or if they uh, pop their uh, toenail and they can't walk anymore. Are you looking to diversify your investment portfolio and maximize your returns? By learning short-term investing skills, you can yield higher returns at compressed speeds by creating income on a daily and weekly basis. Today's sponsor, Lightspeed Investing, has amassed over a decade's worth of success and experience in this field to teach you how to leverage the futures in commodity financial markets. Inspired by the billionaire natural gas trader, John Arnold, Lightspeed Investing has built a proprietary training and educational platform. For more information, connect with President and CEO, Philip J. Hawk Chan on LinkedIn, where you can start your journey towards financial freedom and abundance at Lightspeed rates like many medical professionals already have. So skin care, you said, was a big deal. So we're bringing mole skin. We're taking care of blisters, extra socks. You know, if there's going to be rock climbing, certainly similar things for your hands. It sounds like duct tape 
really is going to have a lot of different uses, whether you're using it to wrap up a wound or you're creating a splint of some kind. What about like laceration? Let me answer this this way. You want your tools of your trade. If you get up there, and now sometimes you can't take everything you want, because like if you're on a, a long backpack trip, you can't take a big, heavy signal manometer and stethoscopes <laughs> and all the equipment that you want to do. A reflex hammer. Reflex hammer and all that. <laughs> exactly. But if, but here's the deal. You, if you like suturing, take a couple needles and some sutures and you can suture people. If you, and if you have the place, take some lidocaine and, it's, and I guarantee you, if you have it, you'll be so grateful for it. We were just in a remote place in October and I had all that. I actually fell and tri- cut my head on my eyebrow, a very common injury. And we had some medical students with us and they said, oh, it's too bad we don't have any suturing. I said, well, I do. And they sutured me up and it was just fine. And so having your tools of the trade is really important. And there's a lot of things that you can take, you know, like suturing material that doesn't take a lot of weight and you'll become a hero if you can. So I tell the medical people when they go out, what would you want? And then of those things you want, what can you take in your backpack? that you know that you can. And like, can you take a stethoscope? Can you take a pulse oximeter? You can estimate people's blood pressures without the heavy sigma manometer, but they have those light ones now that, I mean, that you can take that aren't so bad. So the tools of the trade is really important. And the other thing you want in your backpack, in your first aid kit, is the medicines that you're going to need. Now, everyone always asks, well, what antibiotics, what pain pills, and so forth? Well, it depends upon the trip. Like if you're just going on a picnic with everyone and you're 20 minutes from home, you don't. But if you're going uh, on a, any overnight experience, of course you're going to need antibiotics because they're going to get diarrhea. They're going to get a skin infection. If you're on a four or five day river trip down the Grand Canyon or you're over in Europe on a river trip or wherever you go in Central America, if somebody gets diarrhea or you might think that they're going to have something, you're going to need antibiotic for that if they cut and they get a skin infection, sinus infection. I will tell you the antibiotics which I recommend that people take if they're on a multi-day trip. And then you can, you know, So it's my opinion that every skin infection deserves penicillin to start with, you know, Augmentin or something, you know, the generic brand uh, of something that will handle strep and staph, which means you might want to cover MRSA. And that means you need doxycycline or something of that. The advantage of doxycycline, it treats everything else. It can treat skin infections. It can treat lung infections. It can treat a lot of things. And if someone gets bitten by a tick, if you find a tick on someone, you want to just give them a dose of doxycycline. Perfect. And if, if you're in the back country, you start it. Absolutely. Of course. And I'd actually teach that. And then people are pan allergic and things like that. So I usually take three or four antibiotics with me to make sure that we're covered on that. A lot of times people could fall on a filthy river, a sturdy, get dirt in the wound. They're going to be okay. And if they're allergic, you can do something, clindamycin maybe, or Keflex or something, which would cover those skin diseases too. And then with Doxy, you're covered. And then you need something for pain. Nothing in the world, as you probably know, I think is better than ibuprofen. I mean, everyone's tried to make something better for pain. Ibuprofen is really just our best pain med overall. Now the question then becomes Tylenol and are you going to take a narcotic? That is the question that you have. And if you are going to take a narcotic, it's not a bad idea, but you have to be careful with that when you do take narcotics because of the obvious reasons. But if someone breaks a bone and you're on day three of a river trip, are you going to want some more tap? So you get someone to write you a prescription for your Lord and you just keep it in your kit. And if somebody needs it, you have it. I rarely take narcotics with me on the trips that I go on, but I have taken it when I've been on longer trips where I've been the camp doctor or something. I make sure that we have those in case there's a broken boat or something. So that's also another thing. Wound care, splint care, tools of your trade, those become very important to carry with you. I, I guarantee you that if you are a medical person and you're listening to this podcast, and then what, what I mean by that is, I'm sure your listeners are fascinated with all the people that you have. They've all been so interesting. But you're going to have people who say, well, how, how do I get narcotics? or I get those antibiotics? Well, even if you are a medical person, you can get a friend or someone to write those for you so you can put them into your kit and, the, and that you have them. Just make sure they're documenting in the chart appropriately because you don't want to get a call from OPMC for incorrect prescription documentation. It is a perfectly appropriate prescription to write the issue is just their documentation. So they got to write a note. Absolutely. Without any question. I've been the camp doctor for a bunch of kids that go up in the mountains and you can write, I am allowed to write prescriptions for the camp medical kit for antibiotics, and ibuprofen, 
even if I document it correctly, even I can give them some Tylenol with codeine or some codeine or some Lortab if I think it's appropriate. And I've had to do that in the past. And then the nurses lock it all up and then I give them orders on how to give it if I'm not there. And that works really nicely. So there's ways to do that that is legal and appropriate and you might need to. But if you're just going out on a river trip with yourself, make sure you've got some antibiotics. Make sure that you've got something for nausea boy, and then yeah, something for pain. If you're a clinician yes. out there, where would we be without steroids? Where would I mean, I don't know where I would be without steroids in my practice. No, yeah, the medical world has changed. So here, so the, I was going to mention two others. And the first one I was going to mention before steroids was an EpiPen. If somebody goes in anaphylaxis and you don't have an EpiPen anywhere, you're going to really regret that. Now, as you know, uh, in addition to EpiPens, they like us to give an H2 blocker and they also like us to give Benadryl and, they, and then if needed, steroids. And I carry all those. If I'm going on a multi-day trip and like backpack and if I can take those, especially on a river trip, I have all of those. But I never go anywhere without an EpiPen. Like that would just be, I think, especially... Being a physician and doing wilderness, if somebody has anaphylaxis, most times people will know if they're going to go into anaphylaxis, they're allergic you know, to a nut or to something, and they'll have their own EpiPen. You should have your own. Absolutely. And steroids and an H2 blocker and Benadryl. The pack just keeps growing. I just pictured the space blanket and duct tape and had maybe a Swiss Army knife. And now uh, we've got a sphygmomanometer and uh, five different antibiotics. Different kinds of medicines and things like that. That becomes the the challenge that we have is to make sure that we have enough. So you, you you raised an interesting question about space, and that was how much space you have and how much. That's why you divide them up. If you know, so here's a question, and this is something that I I don't know the answer to, and that is at what point do you say to someone because of your illness you should not go on this trip? For example. I had a question. I was giving a lecture. I was actually in Chamonix, France, giving a lecture on this sort of topic we're talking about now. And in the audience, a physician who was from Ohio had asked to be the medical director of a group of hikers and then trekkers and then climbers in the Himalayas. So they were going to have to fly over to Nepal, then to Lakla, and then they were going to go up into the mountains, and then they were going to climb. And she asked, there's a bunch of physicians, nurses, and PAs that's in the audience. And, they, and, she, and she said, I have a problem. I have a guy that's going over that is a, he calls himself a brittle diabetic, and he has a seizure disorder. Should I let him come? Now, I, this then became a debate, of course, at a wilderness medicine setting, at what point? So if he's, uh, you know, he says his seizures, he's been six months since the seizure. They're pretty well controlled. They have these newer medicines, and he felt comfortable. But he, but here's the deal. If you have a problem, and you are climbing on a wall and you have a seizure and you fall, then everybody's at risk. Then everyone has to evacuate it. So she was in a dilemma as to what do I do with that sort of situation. And so everybody in the room gave an opinion and gave her advice. I don't know what she did. But I would ask the people listening to this, what would you do? I tell the people that in my state, and I live in the state of Utah in the United States, that if you go six months without a seizure, you can drive a car. Why not go climbing? If you can drive a car, why not climb? You know, if you have a good belayer. And so I, we kind of use that as a guideline for seizures. I think that's a great guide because someone at some point in risk management and an actuary probably sat down and did some kind of risk calculation to decide if it was appropriate. And hopefully, or, or someone just winged it and now we're using their work. No, well, that's exactly right. And so when we actually started getting into wilderness medicine 25 years ago, there weren't really a lot of protocols out there. And so we got a lot of people together on committees and talked about it. And well, what should we recommend at my medical school in wilderness medicine to the students we teach? When could, do we let somebody go? Well, look at the guidelines in your state. They let you drive a car, then they should let you go into the back country. The people decide you take extra Keppra with you or whatever it is you're on and, and then double the dose if they have a seizure. And does that mean you have to go out? Well, maybe, but if, if they're used to it, you know, you can play around with it. And the same thing with diabetes, if it's generally well controlled. And I think that's kind of what the advice we gave to her, that she kind of came away that, but here you are though, now austere. You're in, you're not, you're in the middle of, not, talking about not being in the middle of nowhere. You land in Nepal, which is a long ways away. And then you take a tiny plane in Lakla, which is a long ways away. And then you hike for three days. And now you are nowhere near help. You're high up in the mountains. 
And for reasons that is really unknown, people, uh, diabetics, especially type 1, the ones that are prone to ketoacidosis, altitude brings it on. And I don't know that all those guys in Stanford and all the, around the world are trying to kind of figure that one out. But there you are at altitude now and you have diabetes. Are you going to have ketoacidosis or if you have a seizure disorder on top of that? You know, things that trigger seizures at home could be something, but when you go out there, who knows? Who goes to altitude and then eats these mountain home meals that have a lot of salt in it, maybe? Maybe that triggers your seizure. It's a real challenge, and we get a lot of those questions, and we kind of turn it back on the people, like, do you feel, do will you feel comfortable being the clinician knowing that situation that you have? Richard, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to just take us back to things that are maybe more common for most physicians, right? Because most of us aren't going to be wilderness physicians that are that are in that. And if we are in that situation, you know, we better be better educated about it. You know, I want to talk more about some injuries that we might see more commonly if we're just on a like a day hike with our family. Someone cuts themselves and there's quite a bit of blood, right? And you're holding pressure and it's not working. Maybe you you're, you tried sutures, but it's bleeding through it. And now you've got to apply a tourniquet. You know, like, uh, let's talk about that. But then other things kind of in that that we're going to see closer to home where we're just really staving off an emergency, turning something emergent into something urgent, and then making our way back home. This is an interesting discussion because what this podcast is becoming is a wilderness medicine course. And I'm happy to talk about that. So in wilderness medicine, you know, all through med school and training, you say tourniquet is a last resort. In wilderness medicine, it's first-line therapy because you cannot replace blood. So if somebody has a real bad bleed, put a tourniquet on. It's going to hurt, but you can assess what's going on and you can see what is happening. I was in a just a day camp up in the mountains and some 16-year-old boy decided to cut an apple in half with one swat of the knife. Like he said, I can do this. So he, he held it in his hand. It was a boy, a 16-year-old kid, a boy, and he sliced, he did, he sliced that apple in half with one slice. And then he cut the superficial and the deep palmar arches. So he starts screaming and he's got four arteries now, just squirting blood out of his body. Well, what do you do? Well, direct pressure is not going to any of that. So it was a day camp. I had my kit there. We just quickly put on a blood pressure cuff and pumped it up till it stops. So now we have a blood pressure cuff on this kid. And then you can assess the situation and clean it off. Anyway, I just thought he's cut everything. Like he's got, the hand surgeons had a heyday with him, but he's alive. We stopped it. So now he's got a tourniquet on. Well, it's hurting him. And I thought, well, we're not going to get him back to the hospital. So we got this big wad of really hard uh, material and wrapped it into his hand, into a ball. And then I tied it on as tight as it was humanly possible. And then we slowly released the tourniquet, which is the blood pressure cuff, and lo and behold, the, it stopped the bleeding, just the pressure of his hand wrapped around it. And then the parents took him. I gave him the, the blood pressure cuff and said, look, go to the ER. If he starts bleeding it, put the blood pressure cuff on it, just leave it on until you get there. But that's, they fix it up. So a tourniquet could be first line, should be, and uh, is often first line therapy. And, and what could be used? Because I'm picturing Rambo, like with a belt, tightening it with his teeth while he's, I don't know, doing whatever with his other hand. Like, what, what, can, what are effective tourniquets? A shirt, a cloth, rip it. Don't use a wire. Don't use a string. Use mm-hmm. something. Uh, I had to do that uh, on a road once. I, I came across a bike accident. A guy had amputated his lower leg. I took a shoelace. You just happened to on a lot of stuff, huh? That was a weird one. That was going down to hike in the southern Utah. And I saw this, they were over and no one had, no one was there. And I went over, I actually passed them. And then I thought, man, I better go back. So I turned around and went back and he'd been hit by a car and amputated his left arm and left leg and his eyes were bugged out. And that guy ended up dying, it turned out, I found out. But he was bleeding from those thumps. And so I just said, oh my gosh. So I just took off my shoelaces. I mean, it was just like, now what do I, now what do you do? And then the ambulance came and they did a scene flight on him. But no, I mean, you have to stop that bleeding. So what you, but here's the deal. The nice one is if you take his shirt, Take a stick and you wrap it just like that and then tie it off. Oh, you use the stick, you use the stick to like tighten it. So the the you wrap the shirt around you, then you thread the stick through the knot and then you're twisting with that. Yeah, that would work just that would work just great. And it does work. But just remember, in the wilderness, it's an interesting profession because I mean, if you have if you happen to be a neurosurgeon and skilled on the equipment in the OR. 
it's the, it's there there is no training for that in the backcountry. It's the great grounder of wilderness medicine. I mean, you might have be a better suture than someone, but the bottom line is when you're out there, it's it's kind of fun to teach because uh, you you come across uh, these ideas like, wow, a tourniquet. Of course, that's what I'll do next time. But here's the one thing I want to make before uh, the podcast ends. I don't know how much time we have, but I want people to know that there's a lot more to wilderness medicine than like just trauma and bleeding and broken bones and the, things like that. I want people to, the, the, the clinicians to know, like, what sunscreens do you use? Do you know that? Like your family, your friends, your patients are going to say, what sunscreens do I use? Do you know that? And I'm not asking you, I'm asking the listeners, what sunscreen do you put on? What prevents cancer? What prevents sunburns? What are we giving now? So we have a whole lecture and a whole a thing on what podcast because, I mean, what sunscreens because, in this podcast, because sunscreens are insanely important to prevent skin cancers and sunburn. Now they've got these new broad spectrum sunscreens out there now that have zinc oxide in them or magnesium dioxide that will completely prevent the uh, sun from getting the skin about nine, maybe 95, 97%. We're getting rid of the chemical sunscreens. We're going to the more physical and the more broad spectrum sunscreens because they found that the chemical ones were causing cancer because people thought that if they put them on, they could stay out longer, but they weren't being as effective. So we want people to know about things like sunscreens and we want them to know about like, what, do you, what are we using to treat blisters now? We used to use moleskin, but we're, moleskin now has changed. It's thinner. We're using these dual layer films now that we're putting on. But most important is we're using wool socks, double layer socks. And we want physicians, clinicians, medical people to know that your patients should have wool on their feet and nothing else. And I know they got some synthetic brands. Maybe they're going to be as good. But you know, right now, merino wool is the best thing to put on your feet. Trim your toenails. And if you know this, then you're going to be a really good clinician and help prevent the injuries that you're going to see in patients. You can go to the University of Utah site. Can I say it? It's wildmedu.org. Wildmedu, and that's a, the letter U, dot org. Everything on there is free. You could, like, if you want to learn about sunscreens, you want to learn about blisters, you want to learn about hand injuries, climbing injuries, just read the chapter and before you go out, and it'll give recommendations of how to choose what to put in your first aid kit. And we want people and the clinicians and the doctors and the dentists and the podiatrists and the chiropractors and everybody who's a medical professional to know that when they go out, that they're going to be the ones that are going to have to answer the questions. And your podcast is absolutely perfect for this because it is exactly something where the people who should know need to know and they can and they will know if they just take some time. These are the great questions. But I don't want them to just think that it's trauma because wilderness medicine is far greater than that. Austere medicine is really a, a lot about prevention. We say, what are the common injuries? How do you prevent them? How do you treat them if they happen? And how do you evacuate them? So always be thinking that when you go in the back country. Always, what are the common things that are going to happen? How do you prevent those? Like, man, just don't let them happen. And then if they do happen, how do you treat them? And then how do you evacuate? And then finally, if something dastardly happens in emergency, then survival. And if you manage that, you'll be a good clinician, whatever your practice is. And I'm not sure the makeup of your broad audience, but I know that the people that are listening today are thinking, yeah, that's me, whatever that means. So I think it's important. And they'll be a lot more prepared for having listened to this. Dr. Richard Ingerbritson, thank you so much for your time and, you know, with all that you've contributed to medicine. Well, and thank you for what you're doing. Like this is, I've listened to your podcast and the things that you put on there are so useful. I love the practical nature of medicine. And like you say, I mean, the Krebs cycle is important, I guess, you know, to understand how it works. But when you get out and especially in my branch of medicine, wilderness medicine, the sunscreens have more importance, you know. So thank you so much. An honor to be on here. Thanks again from Heidi. Elevate your practice with a free AI scribe, zero cost, HIPAA compliant, and time saving. Ready to swap? We've got you covered for past AI scribe expenses. Head to HeidiHealth.com, get started, and make your practice the envy of every Seth Scope in town. Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post, or write us a five-star review, something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee, and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. 
even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you. This is not a doctor-patient relationship, and this is not medical advice, or financial advice, or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to The Physician's Guide to Doctoring.